Well, hello, 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 and welcome. And what a phenomenal turnout we have this evening. 550 people and counting rolling in as a phenomenal waterfall of joy. I can say hello to you. Bonjour, white and Gaisic Esquire in the languages, the indigenous languages of this place. Thank you so much for joining us. My name's Jade. I'm part of the team at the Outdoor Learning Store. We're a North American wide charitable nonprofit that's dedicated to offering outdoor learning, equipment, resources, and professional development for educators and learners like you. Uh, and everything we do goes back into supporting other uh, outdoor educational nonprofits. We also work closely with Take Me Outside, they're our partner in delivering this workshop series. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm joining you this evening, uh, and this is just a quick version because I want to get to the main event. Um, I'm joining you from the land of the Snakes people, the the, the bull trout people. Uh, I'm in Skihican, uh, right on the big eddy of the Columbia River, what colonially is known as Rebel State, British Columbia. Uh, it's the place where the ridge lines meet the water, Skihican, um, and over different times um, and over different slightly geographical scales, this place is also incredibly special and has been stewarded, hunted, fished, cared for and loved uh, in perpetuity and still is uh, by the Shkretmet people to the west, the Shushwap people, by the Okanagan silks to the south, grasslands, and by the Tanaha people on the east, uh, and they call this place Miskakas, the place of the chickadee. And so I'm very grateful and honoured to be an uninvited guest living uh, on this place. So within Turtle Island or North America, um, land-based learning must honour the traditional knowledge of these Indigenous populations. And so we ask now, if you do have that knowledge, can you please share a, a short um, message, uh, sharing what chat uh, in the chat, which Indigenous territories you're joining from this today? And if you're living uh, on traditional and unceded territory and you don't know whose land it is, you can visit native dash land dot ca it actually has information on indigenous groups from across the world uh, and you can learn more and land acknowledgements are just the starting point they are the starting point for relationship building with your local indigenous first nations or native groups um, but it means uh, something in this moment for us to show our gratitude uh, and our thanks for this place i'm also going to share in a moment a very exciting project that ties into this over to you steph Thanks, Jade. And I'll just take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, if you are new to the workshops, uh, then hello. It's so nice to have you here. Uh, perhaps Jade and I are familiar faces, uh, but welcome. And it's so lovely to have all of you folks here. So I work for Take Me Outside, and we are uh, a nonprofit that works closely with the Outdoor Learning Store, but also we have 50 plus outdoor learning partners uh, working alongside us. And we're so excited to be here this evening. I'm joining you from Coast Salish Territory uh, on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. And I'm joining you uh, from where the Kawatsin people and the Cowichan tribes and the Hokaminam speaking people have been uh, stewarding this land since time immemorial, since uh, long before uh, the, my ancestors came over here from Europe. And I currently live under a beautiful mountain and that is currently called Prevot and I've been learning more about it. Uh, and its traditional name is Sukwas. And uh, I'm enjoying learning more about the the land, the language of the land from where I'm at. And it's wonderful seeing everybody writing their hellos in the chat. We're going to do an official poll in a second. I'll pass it back over to Jade. Thanks so much, Steph. Um, so welcome, everyone. If you're just joining us to this place of partnership, growth, of sharing and caring, uh, these workshops are for you and for us to learn together. And so we thank you for taking the time to support us, our creators, and all of the people who benefit from you sharing the knowledge that you've gained here tonight. And um, so this work really matters for the physical, social, emotional well-being and academic of our young people. And so we're really glad you're investing your time in learning more about it here tonight. So thank you. If you're just joining us, Zoom 101, uh, we are going to have a phenomenal Q&A, time for a Q&A with... Um, Julia at the end. So please type any questions in the chat. Wonderful Steph and Duncan are behind the scenes collecting them all. They're putting them into a doc for me and then I'll pose them to Julia at the end. With nearly 800 people in, we can't answer them as they come in. So we're going to do it right at the end. And with this many people, we might not get to all of them, but yeah, we'll try our very, very best. So um, questions go in the chat. 
Um, you can leave your video on if you like. It's lovely to present to real faces, but you can turn it off if that makes you feel more comfortable. We've got closed captions. You can go down to the more button um, and click um, uh, under there. There'll be a button to say view um, uh, subtitles. So if you have any hearing impairment, uh, you can get access to that there. Um, we've got the presentation, Q&A and then prizes at the end. So please stay right to the end because we have some fantastic offers for you. You'll access the recording, a discount code for resources from the store and your certificate of attendance will come in a link into your email um, by lunchtime tomorrow at the latest. If you haven't got it by then, check your spam because it could be in there. All right, let's get things started. I've got a couple of polls to get you going. And normally we start with a poll um, that is, uh, where are you joining us from? And I just do different areas in North America, but people, so many people came from across the world um, that I've added a little extra on. So at the top, there's a, where are you joining us from parts of North America? But if you scroll down to the bottom, it will see which continent are you joining us from? You can answer one or both. Um, can you see the polls, people? Excellent. I'm going to give you just 10 seconds. Let's see how many people can get to their screens in that. And you can just click the button. I'm going to say five, four, three. Not letting me submit or... Two, one. Okay, I'm ending the poll it's there. Working. I don't think it's working. Oh, I'm sorry, Julie. Thanks for letting me know. I can't uh, do much here, but let me share the results. Okay. I'm really sorry. I'm not seeing it there. Okay, share in the chat. Give me a moment in the chat if you... Um, let me know where you're coming from. Uh, I'm Fortunately, sometimes these polls don't work, and that's what it is. People saw it for a moment. I couldn't see it on my screen either, so... Um, just yeah, come on, let's have a waterfall of places and cultures and let's see where we can, if we can see anywhere that's coming from a, a far off place. I can see the poll and I see that a number of people answered. So I'm, sometimes Zoom's just funny like that, but I do see some, some answers coming in. Okay. <laughs> can you tell me where the furthest away person is, Steph? Hmm, sure. Uh, Let's see, 11 in Europe, seven in Australia. Oh, two in Asia. It doesn't say, you know, more specifically, but. Ah, that's fantastic. Thanks yeah. for joining us um, tomorrow in the future or possibly very late at night. I like it. Time travel uh, happening right now. OK, I'm going to try the Who Are You poll. I'm launching it now. Some people might be able to see it. Um, it's asking where, which kind of educator you are. And Steph, if you see it, then maybe you can give us a bit of a run through uh, when I end it. Sure. I'm going to give you five seconds if you can see it. If you can't, I do apologize. It's just sometimes the technological gremlins are having their way. Let's give it five seconds. Three, two, one. I'm going to end the poll and share those results. What do you see, Steph? Uh, I see we have pretty much representation across the board, a lot from kindergarten up to grade six, and a good representation from the early childhood educators and forest school folks, uh, and then a good, a good amount of supporters, parents, community folks. How fantastic. Okay, we'll keep moving. Um, okay, we have, uh, thank you for sharing. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, we have teamed up with over 50 North American partners to keep this network buzzing with the best in outdoor and environmental education. Uh, from papers to podcasts, funding to fables, we've connected the brightest in the bunch, uh, the best in our world, we think. Uh, and so I'm going to share my screen for just a second. Um, and Steph's going to pop the links to our partner page. And you'll be able to see uh, all of our fantastic people. So let me get started here. And then we're getting one step closer uh, to the real magic and to the main event here. So um, here we go. Welcome. This is 
My goodness, in fact, the first of our outdoor learning winter virtual workshop series. Uh, we did have Monique Gray Smith uh, initially, but we've had to redirect her. She wasn't very well to the 8th of February. So this is the lineup. Uh, and we are so excited to have you today for Dirty Teaching, a beginner's guide to learning outdoors. Um, here we have our international partners that support this work. We have our North America, our United States partners our Canadian partners, and there's a few more. And now we're just incredibly very quickly want to learn, uh, launch this amazing program that there's been going on for years behind the scenes to make this happen. There was a smaller local pilot first, but this is four seasons of reconciliation. Um, this is uh, 10 reconciliation learning online modules that runs from February to June. Uh, you get a certificate of completion from the First Nations University of Canada. If we can find that person that's wonderful thank you so much as a part of this you also get five optional opportunities to gather virtually with indigenous leaders elders and educators and you get 25 dollars to support your own indigenous learning resource stock um this is an amazing opportunity um it is created um by Indigenous content creators, and it's an online learning. It's self-paced. Um, the modules are super easy to consume. It's a mixture of video, media, and text. And we're just really, really excited. The link is in the chat. We're so excited to share this with you. Uh, that's Jenna Jassik in the background, who spearheaded this, the most incredible person. And um, I'm just so grateful. This is our first lineup of speakers um, crossing Turtle Island and sharing with you uh, their perspectives. Ha <laughs> ha, but we're here. Okay, so this is all about dirty teachings. It's Juliet's book. She's also got the most amazing book, Messy Maths, which is fantastic. And here we go. You know, I, this Juliet is absolute gold. I could do, I could probably spend the entire 45 minutes left just introducing Juliet and the things she's done. Um, she's one of the world's leading education consultants specializing in outdoor learning and play. She's so passionate about enabling uh, schools, play organizations and early year settings to provide really quality outdoor learning opportunities. As far as she goes, she's probably one of the most influential people on my teaching practice and someone that I think you'd be hard pushed to find who's had more influence on more educators and therefore students than anyone in our world. I am so pleased to introduce uh, the inimitable, absolute favourite, Juliet Robertson. Welcome. Oh, thank you very, very much, um, Jade, for that welcome. I'm quite embarrassed because really I'm just another person sitting here. I saw my friend Elizabeth confess she's in her pyjamas. I'm not, not even from the waist downwards, but nevertheless, um, you know, I, I do feel that um, all I am is a, a teacher who happened to have written a book about all the mistakes she made and what she learnt from them. Um, so I'm going to just start by saying um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives to be here, whether this is here in the moment or later watching um, um, the, the recording. The two books I've written are Dirty Teaching and Messy Maths. Dirty Teaching is aimed at those who work primarily with six to 12 year olds, whereas Messy Maths is for those who work with three to six. So given the limitations of time, this has been much more the focus. I am going for that elementary level. It doesn't mean to say what I'm going to say isn't relevant to any other sector, but um, please forgive me for, for having to, to sort of be quite um, specific in my focus today. Right, um, let's see. Um, Dirty Teaching was written nine years ago, or actually 10 now, and published nine years ago for a UK teaching audience. Um, and I've been very humbled by the international interest in the book. Yet with this comes an awakening for me as an author. First of all, the impact of colonialism, both in Scotland and then continuing that abuse of power and land worldwide needs more consideration than what is in this book. In Scotland, there is a growing awareness of the need for truth and reconciliation and that justice is needed alongside this process. 
However, what this looks like in our context, well, we're only at the beginning there of, of beginning to even think about it. However, on the screen here, you will see I've put the Gallic alphabet up because I believe that our Gallic language and culture may have learning for the rest of us in Scotland. If you look, each letter is represented by a native tree or shrub. And each letter also links to the old language of Ogham, written in sticks and lines that have popped in at the bottom left hand corner. If you look at a map of Highland Scotland, most of the hills and streams only have Gaelic names. So I, I, raise, I say this to help raise awareness of identity and culture and the vital links to the land that happens. We, we, our culture grows out of our land um, and we, we need to be thinking more about that. And I, I don't think I've got that quite right in dirty teaching. Um, so alongside that, um, I'd like to apologise in advance if I make in, um, any inappropriate comments in relation to colonialism. Please don't be afraid of picking me up. I am learning and I'm reflecting and I hope that some of this comes through, but I'm aware that I've only taken the first footsteps of a long journey. Right. OK, so one of the things that I have I have become aware of is that um, within our teaching systems, generally, we've been conditioned to think indoors. If you look at these statements, these are from young teachers. The default position in many curricula and teaching methods worldwide is that real learning happens indoors. So this is why dirty teaching and other books are needed. We are having to rethink these traditional education possibilities. Um, I just would like to say too, please do use um, the chat facility to keep me informed. I mean, Jade's already asked about, said about questions, but do share. I'm, I'm more than happy for a secondary conversation to be going on in the chat while I'm busy talking, because actually I think that enriches things as well. Um, and again, I, I won't be dashing off at the end. I'll be making time to spend with anybody who cares to stop. And, and to have those conversations. I'm aware that there's a huge number of people, but I'm always up for these sorts of things. OK, so in terms of aims of this particular presentation, it's really just about the practicalities of teaching outside, particularly when you've got 30 children and there's only you. Um, and I'm also going to offer a framework that I use within elementary education once formal education has begun for planning and creating sessions outside. Um, key messages. Well, really, this is my experience that even any effort to get outside is worth it and the health benefits alone add value. OK, the research is emphatic about this. Um, change re requires determination, and that's up to us as individual teachers, as well as at a whole school level. But if we don't commit as individuals, then we're not going to get outside. Finally, um, I would just like to say we don't question using a music room to teach music or an IT suite or using a gym. So why do we query using our school yard and why, why, why is this such a big issue? So again, dirty teaching is about tackling those myths and concerns and perceived barriers of working outside when actually it's simply another space and a very valuable space at that because of the richness of the land and nature, the weather, the seasons and so on that just add depth to what we do. Um, in terms of outdoor learning, I like to keep my definition very, very simple. It's simply any learning that takes place outside. And I tend to think of it as a three legged stool, chop one leg off and it's out of kilter. Um, and generally these these three labels people place and experience. You can change. 
according to what works well for you in your context. So, for example, within the early childhood education curriculum in Scotland, um, our main document, um, Realising the Ambition, talks about <coughs> inter oops, interactions and experiences and environment. And again, maybe perhaps for you in your context, the word land might be better than place or country. So, so take account of the indigenous perspectives and understanding of the role of, of the outdoors and, and how this is all interwoven. And of course, time matters too, because things change through time, both seasonally and through the years and developmentally, how a two or three year old perceives an outdoor space is very different to a 10 year old. And again, that's very different to a 16, 17 year old and so on. So we just need to be very mindful of all of this. Um, when it comes to um, thinking outside, try not to feel that you have to have a special outdoor learning plan or curriculum. What I say is stick to what your school asks you, but where you think there are outdoor possibilities, simply highlight those and date them in your planning, whatever format that is. And then if you do go outside, then afterwards tick it and and then add a brief comment as you would with any other lesson um, in this particular whiteboard from many years ago you can see that the teacher here has put up what's expected today and you see where it says maths it's very obvious to the class that that's going to be outdoors and what the focus is it's going to be angles so as you can see there is no outdoor learning our curriculums are too busy we're, we're too stuffed let's just value um, the outdoors as I say as that place or that context for the learning to happen so just moving on, I love this quote from Simon Beams, and it's simply, we're not saying goodbye to our classrooms, we're opening them up. And I would like to say that if you think about the hours, the, the emphasis that has been put on developing things for a tiny little box of a classroom, we haven't even begun to turn the tap of potential on what is possible outside. So, so really bear that in mind. We're again at a starting point here. Um, and I think it's a very, very exciting future that way. So what I always say too, is that we need to use the outdoors and bring to this our skills as educators, or if you're a play worker, play. If you work in an outdoor after school club, um, then, then bring your skills to this actual place that is the outdoors. Um, one of the things is, is there's no rules on how much time you should spend outside, particularly if you are one teacher with 30 children. Sometimes it's easier to begin with just 10 minutes, meet your class after recess um, and, and just spend 10 minutes maybe doing some um, interactive mental maths work or read a story outside. Sometimes that can be so much easier than trying to do a whole lesson outside, particularly when you're getting going or the weather feels a bit inclement. Um, if you need to make things measurable and some things can't be measured in one lesson, but nevertheless, be aware of what your expectations are in terms of you may co-create your learning intentions, you may have success criteria, or you may have it more open-ended, whatever, what, whatever way you teach, just be aware of the fact that you're just looking for what is the learning that's happening. Even in a play-based situation, at the back of our heads, we still have to be aware that there, are, there is learning happening here. Always plan less, not more because there's always going to be things that are going to surprise you. And, and I do believe in going with the children's interests and very often these become life skills. So for example, learning how to, to deal with spiders outside is a life skill, but also you can learn about a lot about um, spiders in the same instance. 
and be realistic know your children know your outdoor space and again this is something i flag up there's a lot of prep work in dirty teaching i say get out there you wouldn't walk into any classroom at nine o'clock without having spent a little time there organizing it even as a substitute teacher you still go in and you do a few last minute plans it's very rare you go in cold so so be sensible about that too explore your outdoor space go into the local community if you don't know the community where your children come from you are missing one a rich opportunity to capitalize on that space but also it gives you very much an indication of 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 what the you know are your is it a poverty stricken area is it a well-to-do area and, and what are the messages coming out of that neighborhood so that's just um a, a few top tips there in terms of the outdoor framework um i've given jade the links to two outdoor frameworks one's just one sheet generic and the other one is more specific to maths where i've really teased it out both will be of use but basically I always say think about what you need to do beforehand how you get outside gathering is really useful and again this relates more to formal situations rather than a play-based approach white sheets are wonderful for drawing attention to objects I talk a lot about finding things that are interesting to children we make the most of the environment PE type games, and of course, the reflection, the reviewing and the journaling. So let's move on and have a think about all of this. So for example, um, in classrooms, we can start by setting clear expectations and we make the most of that prep time. For example, the first few times you go out, it might take a class 15 minutes to get ready, but very, very quickly, we can move that down and set that as a challenge last week it took us 15 minutes i wonder if we can get this quicker this week what do we need to do to make ourselves more efficient when it comes to resources i always say it's much easier to have your resources ready to hand if you've got to go to get a key from a janitor's office that's down three slack flights of stairs and at the other end of a corridor to go outside to open up a shed to take the key back to then go to your class you're never going to get outside you just want things that you can grab and go and ideally that the children take so that you're not loaded up you know so very often just very simple things can do such as um it could be clipboards or it could be magnifying glasses and um it, it's great children are always willing to, to take things when it comes to getting ready things like going to the toilet getting the outdoor kit on again these are all things that children will get more speedy at if this is an incentive for them to do so and there's lots of positive encouragement um, you might want to put distance markings on your floor so that when children line up you can make all sorts of fun lining up challenges for the children to do and link that to to maths or other other things that you're studying um, for example if you're lining up it could be to, that you say how many people had um milk for breakfast and how many people did not have milk at breakfast time it could be as simple as something like that or at lunch time or something or before they came to school if you don't want to, if you want to avoid the, the the queries about whether people had breakfast or not um, anyone who had milk before they came to school today can line up here and those who don't there and then you can sort of count the numbers and compare and contrast um, it is also the ideal place beforehand to introduce some elements of learning because particularly if the weather is inclement it can be really hard competing with the wind and the rain to give out instructions so again sometimes doing a bit of prep work beforehand can help classes getting outside 
is, is a great time to set a challenge or an investigation. You can see here that clearly with this um, primary two or three class, you can see that's grade one, grade two, that you can see that they are clearly challenged to follow the line outside. But it could be as simple as things like what's the most interesting shape you see on your way outside today, if it's going to be a lesson about shape. Or if we stick to that idea of angles, it could be something like, um, you know, which is the most common angle we think we will see on the way outside and how will we we take note of that? And you can do a, an estimate beforehand and then you can have a discussion about it when you get outside. Um, circle activities are absolutely brilliant because you can make the most of your skills as a teacher. So you can see here this school is very fortunate. It's got um, a circle ready drawn outside that happens to be perfect for a class of 30. If you don't have this luxury, a good thing to do is to take a rope um, or join skipping ropes together and tack them off at 50 centimetre intervals and a 15 metre rope will do you for a 30 class um, group of children and they just stand on the tag, pull it tight, drop it down and you've created a circle or you can do sticky elbows um, where you, you get your children to touch elbows and things like that and that can become a game too. I will say for children who are not used to being outside, very often that will be my first lesson, getting outside and making a circle. And believe me, with some classes that can be ambitious. Um, but with practice, everything becomes easier. And you already have loads of circle games that you can easily adapt to being outside. Um, so make the most of these that you already have. In this particular photo, you can see the children are holding one metre sticks and that's for interactive maths where you tap sticks in time and you might do skip counting if you're doing multiplication like zero, two, four, six, you know, and it could be if you're practising odd and even numbers, you tap on odd numbers and you pass the stick to the left round of the circle on even numbers and things like that. So again, lots of possibilities with sticks in circles. Um, another really useful technique that works for all ages and stages is to ask children to find something interesting outside. Can I just say here, it's really good um, when you ask children this to um, think about some things in, as part of a safety talk, it's a risk assessment. For example, you can say to children, is there anything, even if you think it's really, really interesting that you shouldn't bring back to the circle? And children might talk about things like dog poo, or they might talk about things like berries. And then you can have that discussion over whether that is a risky thing to bring back or not, um, whether it's okay to bring back garbage and that sort of thing. And again, you will have to work out what is appropriate within your context. I'm, I tend to be quite sensible about these things and say, if it's really, um, to excuse the Scottish word, manky, don't bring it back. Um, but most other things, I usually ask things to be left. Um, so picking flowers from playing fields where the grass, where the grass cutters are going to chop those flowers, no problem. But I don't think it's OK to strip somebody else's beautifully planted flowers, that sort of thing. If we take mushrooms and fungi, we may actually find that, um, that there isn't enough for other people to enjoy. So, so common sense says, you know, think about what would work in your um, situation. Um, it's also a very good opportunity to establish boundaries so you can say only go as far as the tree or only go as far as the line at the end of the playground or that sort of thing. And the other top tip is put a size limit of the palm of your hand. I keep forgetting to do this and in the past I've had um, litter bins, garbage bins brought back. I've had holly trees uprooted. I've had great big... Um, um, 
bits of wood dragged back entirely my problem because you know i didn't put a size limit on so just that sort of thing can help and if you look at the top of my screen you can see there that the cones have been lined up in order and if you do, again if you don't have much outside you can always um just bring an import in and that just as you find something interesting it's it's maybe not as, as exciting as going for the playground but nevertheless it can work and the lining up can happen within a circle so rather than put it in front of you you can ask each child who has a cone to line up in all size order with the person with the largest cone on your left and the person with the smallest cone on your right and everyone somewhere in between and of course that's going to lead to a lot of discussions about what large means is that the longest in length is it the circumference is it the width do you include any extra bits sort of where it's been attached to the tree so again you will find there's a lot of rich discussions happen there that naturally include descriptive vocabulary linked to science and linked to maths so that that's just the sort of example of possibilities and again if you wanted to tweak that the next time you could do you could repeat the activity but the children aren't allowed to speak yeah so again we're always tweaking we're always using our own creativity and that of the children to really build on the learning I love white sheets. Um, this is not my own idea. I um, found I first saw them being used many years ago in Sweden. This particular sheet in this photo is one meter square. So do you see how even with your resources, you can really bring in clever ways of presenting resources to enable children to learn that bit more because if you think about it when do children get an opportunity to feel what a square meter looks like and to actually use one in their day-to-day -day work they probably don't and if again in the outdoor framework um, that's about maths, I've given you a range of different types of sheets that are made simply by um, drawing different outlines with um, black marker pen. And it's amazing what can be done. And again, you can use your own creativity there, but I've got big grids for whole class work or group work. I've got problem solver ones. I've got ones that are about shapes. I've got tens frames for individual or paired use. I've got big ones, you know, and so on. And I don't wash them very much, only when they get really, to excuse the, the Scottish word again, really manky, do I actually shove them in the wash and give them a wash. You know, otherwise I'll just get dirty again. There is one rule too, is that the moment you bring out these white sheets, a gust of wind will appear to start blowing them over and anything on there. But you can use stones to pin them down or your feet. You know, and very often children are very obliging that way. So these are just some of the reasons why I enjoy using a white sheet. OK, moving on, environmental explorations. Very often when I find people are getting stuck about going outside, this can be one of their, their, their sticking points, that they feel everything has to be tightly linked to the environment. In an ideal world, it's great to capitalise on the environment, but to get going, sometimes we just need to get outside and start teaching outside and develop our com comfort and acclimatise and the children as well. However, these are just some of the reasons why environmental work is, is so effective. And I've deliberately put tyres up there because sometimes all you will have is, is, is a very concrete area. And um, never ever underestimate the value of a car park and vehicles for learning. And yes, you just you just risk assess. Most children are really sensible. They will listen and look and be very aware in a in an area for parked cars and their movements and things like that. But straight away here, I mean, there is something very exciting about things like um, rotational symmetry. And is it the more expensive the car, the greater the number of rotation, the greater the number of rotational symmetry that's possible? Could be. 
I don't think so. But again, children will find that that could be a thing. And very often children will instantly recognise which um, cars are expensive and which ones are, uh, are economy cars. So again, that can lead to some interesting discussions. Other things that can work well are things like circle poems. Um, which were are brilliant because they have no beginning, no end. It's 12 words that when you read them in a phrase um, can, can be read infinitely. And when they're chalked on tyres and you give them a push, don't chalk them on owners' car tyres without permission. Um, but if you've got loose tyres, then certainly you can do this and you can watch the, the circle poems um, go, go spinning round, which is absolutely lovely. The simplest ones I've ever done have been with three-year-olds. I remember one child wanted his name and wanted me. So it was it all around his tyre. We wrote together, I think his name was Wayne. Wayne, me, Wayne, me, Wayne, me. But he was very proud of this work and loved seeing it being moved around the play space. Okay, am I doing all right, Jade? Just all right. It's absolutely brilliant. OK, I'm just making sure that I'm I'm on task. I feel very, it's very odd with so many people because normally I get a chance to sort of check into the chat and see if things are going. So my apologies if there's burning questions at this point. People um, are sharing them and we're collating them, but some people are really inspired and talking about using wheels for fractions of things and the strength of an arc and everything that you talked about, about stimulating conversation and people sharing ideas is all happening back there. And I'll get you a transcript of the chat so you can dive into it later, but it is, it's all stimulating and it's all excellent. Yeah. I, I, I'm really pleased about that because I think the creativity and the capacity for creativity we have as educators at any age group whether that's informal or formal education we must not sell ourselves short here and the same with that of our children we we have so much that we can tap into um, and i love the fact i know for a fact that you can read this book and you will come up with many much better ideas yourself OK, that's just a springboard. That's just to get you going. But all of you have have brilliant brilliance within you and and remember that. And it's even shared better once you start bouncing or what I call riffing with other people. It's like being in a band and you just share these ideas and off you go. And wow, it is exciting. So never forget collaboration and creativity and you will really get there, even if it's online because you don't have the support of other people within your school. There's people out there who are in your tribe and who will absolutely get this. So I will move on. Oh, physical stuff. So when I talk about a high octane class, those are those classes of children who are absolutely buzzing. You know, they can't sit still. They won't be quiet and things like that. And I utterly love these classes. And one of the things I do know is that when they go outside, very often two things help. One is running to the end of the playing field and back and the other one is is things that relax and calm them down so it could be mindfulness or yoga or it could be sitting there reflecting and these sorts of things but also physical games work well and the brilliance is is that PE teachers have put so many games and suggestions up on YouTube that you can use these and adapt them to draw out the learning in other areas the other thing too is I'd like to say we are not the outdoor police. This is not about being outside in any weather all the time and making yourself and the children suffer. It could be if you have a truly wild day that you simply go outside, find something interesting, collect objects, bring them back in and you work with them inside. Okay, so, so bear that in mind. Saying that, some of the best lessons I have had have been on crazy weather days where it, it has been windy, it has been rainy and the grade six classes or the grade five classes have absolutely shone. They've been dead excited, but um, we've all, we always vote 
to make sure that they do want to go outside. We make sure that they are offered protection. And sometimes it's literally just those, um, um, well, you know, the, the sort of beanie things that you get when you're on water rides at, um, uh, at um, sort of all these, um, I, I was going to say Blackpool Pleasure Beach, but I can't think of a Canadian equivalent. Canadian Wonderland, just outside Toronto, and you get the beanie things, or when you go up in the Niagara Falls and you go into the Maid of the Mist. So very often, even just stuff like that can help children feel a little more comfortable outside um, in emergency situations. Um, so things like that, and, and children will rise to the occasion. So again, just just um, watch your children and use your common sense that way, um, but don't underestimate their capacity to cope outside and just um, be aware of any issues and illnesses and take that into consideration too, okay? Right, hunts and trails. By setting up treasure hunts in the playground during an interval or lunch, pupils from other classes and year groups often take an interest and try and complete it. Um, so that's always something to remember when you're setting up trails and hunts. But they have various purposes just for recapping or introducing stuff. Um, what is important is that you don't spend three hours one evening carefully creating a beautiful trail that the children then finish in 10 minutes. So a good way around this is to get your children to create trails for other classes to complete. OK, you can also get now books of trails that are set up for maths and things like that, where you go around and they have systems and stuff and it's quite quick to do. But 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 just bear that in mind. I wanted to show you this particular map because it, this was drawn by a grade six child and the detail of it was so good and it was accurate enough that I used it for the two years I worked at this school. Um, as a basic map to give children a rough idea where they would find different um, stations and you can see that by the numbers and things like that. Occasionally you can develop things like Harry Potter hunts and this is on my blog and once you've got those things that you can reuse them um, year after year. So if you do spend time creating a trail, make sure it's something that can be used. And again, trails in local shops and windows can work really well. And if you work in a in a small town or rural area, sometimes that can work particularly well, where children, where that where all the shops are involved in displaying something in their windows and that sort of thing, you know, with a numeracy focus or or something. So so make the most of, of community trails as well. Um, all right, let's move on. I'm just going to talk a little bit about evidencing the learning. Now, dirty teaching doesn't have an explicit chapter on outdoor assessment because as teachers and educators, you already have approaches to assessing your children. They work just as well outside. I've given one or two reviewing things in chapter five in reflection tools. Um, and I've also mentioned in chapter 10, in fact, I brought it out, 10.14 in here, I've given some general stuff over journals. Since I wrote this, um, I did, I did work a lot with um, a group of teachers in Dundee on looking at mathematical journaling. So I just want to talk about more in depth journaling, just in case this is something that also um, resonates or has use for you. And again, there is a download about this just to get you thinking. So some of the pluses are things like um, it helps children remember what happened. I'm very interested not in in children writing up paragraphs or diary types, but actually um, using things like sketch noting and diagrams and math sentences, which are equations so that they learn to do things quickly and things that um, maybe appeal to other parts of their brain and not simply, you know, gosh, we've always got to do some writing. Essentially, we're helping children build on the learning and progress their thinking. 
as well as record what's learning outside. And it's useful to be tight about the time. A 10 minute focus can be very, very helpful. Again, some journaling like as referenced in here is longer than that. But this is this can be very helpful just to have a short, sharp focus once children get into about grade two up to uh, and beyond. But the process has to be modeled. So in other words, you can't just expect children to, to magically do this. You actually have to teach it and work with them and show what, what, what quality looks like. So here's an example of a, of, of a starting journal with a class. So what I do is we always just, as we go into the class, we grab an old sheet of paper or piece of card, A5 inside, uh, in size. So if you've got lots of, um, rough old bits in an art cupboard that nobody's using anymore those are perfect for this sort of thing and you can see here that this is very set out what they're learning to what learning has happened here and you can see that it was in a circle they were talking about decimals and you can see that they they're illustrating what the concept of 3.5 looks like using tens and ones so again a child looking back at that should be able to explain the learning and sketch noting is good. Um, one of the things is, is that there is a tendency to overdo um, things. So, so do stick to the time limit. Normally, when you start off, recall or descriptive like this journal insert is the norm. But eventually, we want to change that into higher order thinking. All right. And it doesn't have to happen every time. It may not be applicable, um, especially if just part of the lesson took place outside but again it's just an opportunity to build skills in um, and again if if you do it on card or on bits of paper you can peg them up you can display them quickly and you can build them up week on week um, as a as a as a journal and that gets around this awkward situation that I always seem to have of having a workbook what we'd call a jotter in Scotland and I'd start out with gusto at the start of the year and then the focus would change and we'd be left with loads of blank sheets and then you have that professional guilt does that go home do you chop it off oh my goodness me what do you do so it gets around that so this is I, I mentioned about descriptive and recall, but another thing what we want to do is to just think about um, how can we make this higher order thinking and build upon the learning that might have happened. So if you think of a, an activity like you might be outside and you've asked children to to estimate what does one meter look like in length and can they show me by finding objects outside to create this and of course when children do this some of them may not have any concept of what a length of meter looks like um, if they're too young but say you've got grade five children then it might be a recap at the start of the year and afterwards you might discuss with the children how did they know what a meter was and some of them will say well it was this big or other people might say we remembered that we take a big stride to measure it other people might say it's three three jotters in my class or it's about three ruler lengths or something like that so you can talk about these sorts of things so when we when we journal then we might put in a date we might have a quick discussion about what we did outside okay you might do a descriptive recall but you might not because they've already done it so what happens then you could talk about well what techniques could you use to estimate a meter and that's when they might show a person taking a giant step or doing this, a stick person doing that, or somebody else with a jotter or somebody else with a ruler, just so that they remember that these are different ways of remembering how to create a meter. The next question you might decide is that actually you don't want either of those two, but you might go for an evaluative journal entry, which method works best. And again, that requires some thinking and talking beforehand. And then perhaps you might have already done that sort of discussion outside anyway. So your follow up journal question could be, how are we going to use this knowledge if we wanted to measure the playground next week when we go outside? 
how are we going to use this knowledge and then just get the children to brainstorm and then that becomes the lesson plan for next week so again this is why we want creative and evaluative and investigative entries because do you see how we've lifted the thinking above the, what we did outside all right with little children so this is an example from a kindergarten class they're not ready for individual journals so it could be that you go for an approach that involves a class journal and this is one example from one teacher in Dundee and she said it didn't work gathering all her kindergarten children on the mat to say let's think about our maths before we go outside so she decided to try a different approach and she, which worked better she would invite interested children to come and share their thoughts about what the task was going to be outside like estimating for example then before the whole class went outside that group and her would quickly share their thoughts and ideas they'd go outside they'd do the activity they'd come back in again only the children who were interested would join her for that the rest would be on other activities or maybe playing inside and then the the shared ideas would be shared with the class and summarized and if they, if it was always the same children she would encourage the less interested ones to join in and so that there was a rotor over the course of the year another example and i'd like to thank jolene from upper sturt school in um south australia for her wonderful journaling based on claire warden's talking and thinking floor books so you can see here that this is at the start of the year and they're thinking about the risks and the benefits of 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 their bush sessions which is the equivalent of forest school and you can see some of the things they're talking about that are that are dangers outside for example marley has said snakes and the advice is, if you see a snake, you carefully walk back. So again, there is journaling happening here that can be added to when appropriate um, and, and that that's setting the scene for further lessons to come. Window. OK, um, the other thing I just want to say, too, is other methods that come to, um, which you can involve is um, again from Dundee one primary teacher invited three children to participate in the tracking of their progress in terms of their engagement with a with a lesson and their attainment and the scale went from from one which was no engagement they weren't even in the class to sort of one managing to join the class say for 10 minutes out of 30 up to 10 out of 10 which was um 100 engagement they were in the class they were absolutely up there participating they weren't opting out in any way and their attainments might have been absolutely nothing because they weren't there to um they absolutely understood all the concepts they were able to answer the questions um and they were getting things right and they were sharing ideas and things like that and the children and the, the teacher after each less after ma uh, one maths lesson each week outside and one maths lesson inside each week they um, compared their levels of engagement and attainment over 10 weeks what they found was that over 10 weeks improvements did occur in both um, indoors and out but it was consistently 20% or higher outside. What was interesting was that the journaling there wasn't success with for the children who found work in putting pen to paper most challenging and that that didn't improve until the children interestingly were given tablets and they were they became an, a more freedom over what they were doing so for example some children some children ended up um being the recorder of other groups and taking photos and reporting back and things like that so their journaling took on different forms again so be aware of that you know we we have to adapt to our children um 
another teacher from a different school in Dundee she did a more standard approach working in grade six again she said we are doing shape position and movement work outside or, or actually it was just um, shape work and she did a priest test prior to them starting their unit of work outside where they went outside one math session a week and a post assessment. What surprised her was that when she did the pre-assessment, she, she thought that a lot of the children, this would just be recapping and she was shocked at how many children didn't know the basics of what they needed to know. The other thing that was very, very encouraging was that um, every, almost all of them showed improvement, but in particular, two, of, two children ranked up in the top five in the final test um, who didn't consider themselves very maths good at maths had, had scored particularly lowly in the, the pretest and they got a standing ovation from their their peers who realized how how amazing they were and that this wasn't just a one-off potluck piece but this was actually because they really understood what they were doing and Paige the teacher made a very good point here she said why is it that the assessment our national assessments and many other forms of assessment are so indoor based when my children are clearly showing that if we assess them in an outdoor context, they are doing better. They are rising to the occasion. So I thought that that was interesting. And again, she noted that they're more focused, there's less social problems, there's social improvements and they come back inside in a better mood. So I think all those things are a sort of added value to the to the maths in itself. Um, now, I don't know if Mardell has joined us for this um, webinar or not, but um, I have to take my hat off to her for her year long approach to the Berry Buddy project, which you can see here, where she where each child was chose a berry plant, shrub or plant um, to study over the course of the year. And look at the detail that her kindergarten children did. They took their photos, they had to measure it, they had to find out information about it. And I loved this about, you know, what the names are. I love the fact that you've got um, the common name, the Tanaha name, the botanical name. Um, and again, that the child who did this page is recognised. So again, this is a very complete, very in-depth, year-long approach. So this is what I mean by, you know, don't expect, you don't have to be assessing after every lesson. Some things do take longer. And um, I'd just like to thank Mardell for this wonderful, inspiring project. It was one of many things that when we met in person, um, she blew me away with, 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 with what she was doing. Um, so thank you, Mardell. Um, all right, resources, resources, resources. So often we think we can't teach outside because we don't have resources. And um, I state in Dirty Teaching that the biggest resource is ourselves and the children alongside the land or the space that we're using and that anything else is a bonus. I do not mean that in a patronising way, but I think it's a good framework to think about okay the other thing i want to pay credit to is sarah lazarovich who did this wonderful hierarchy of need starting with use what you have borrow swap thrift make buy and i'm hoping that you're seeing this in the pictures that most of the stuff i mean you can get a white sheet and rip it up you know, you know or a pillowcase so we try not to buy stuff we try and use what we have and that could be natural materials it could be recycled objects we retire old resources outside raid that lost cupboard okay i always say we've got to become raiders of the lost cupboards in schools because in there there will be resources that can be retired outside i have counters and i have all sorts of bits and pieces that i've gathered over the years and very often we need to make sure that the resources are tough enough to withstand being outside so common sense says if you have something beautiful 
don't take it outside it will get ruined and lastly this goes back to making the most of your creative capacities and that of the, your children you tweak to transform um, now I think at this point I'm going to stop sharing um, how do I stop sharing stop sharing and I want you to see me is it possible to make me the main person um, oh the there you are my dear right I'm just going to give you an example of how we tweak to transform when it comes to resources and this goes for any curriculum idea so many years ago I was working with um, some kindergarten children <coughs> excuse me who had additional support needs and one child liked to sit outside so I gave him a viewing frame like this um, in his bag of stuff so he'd always get a bag and he'd always take things out and he just loved this viewing frame and the conversations so the next week I thought right viewing frame really worked for this child how can we tweak this and we put double-sided sticky tape around the frame so that when he discovered it in his bag we showed him that he could stick things that he could find outside so we did that we took a photo of him and that went home to his parents as just a nice little present from the outdoor thing common sense says um that from there we did other frame things who says you have to keep the same sized frame you can vary the size of it one time now excuse um I've, I've put duct tape over this cardboard resource because i'm a lazy teacher and it's just because i use them for presentations in webinars and outside but flaps like this for very little children work brilliantly they work even better if you add a mirror onto them and then they can be used for looking at trees exploring the ground and things like that for um catching the sun all sorts of possibilities but if you have one flap let's use manual dexterity and see what happens when we do peekaboo with two flaps it could be that another time i had um different sized ones large and not so large or large and small depending on where children are at with their vocabulary and of course you're always going to get children who want to throw things so that's great they can throw these frames and you can look and see where they land and see what's there and have a discussion about it all of this started with Joseph Cornell and Steve Van Maitre, the earth educators who advised leaf slideshows where you take double-sided cardboard you find a leaf you stick it in and you hold it up to the light i'm so sorry i can't show you what that looks like but you can see roughly there that there's um you can see the leaf veins and things like that so that's a discussion point but look at that you can get the children to note their ideas over that and this can be an introduction into similes for example what does this remind you of it's like long pointy fingers that are reaching out it's like round it's round and copper like a two pence coin the edges are pointy and jaggy so again you can get descriptive writing going again you might notice you've got circles here squares here you can make it any shape you want you can do it with um, houses you can move this on to landscape work so if you take a frame and this is a bit gone a bit loose but if you are landscape sketching having frames like this for working in the foreground the middle and and the background can be really really useful and for looking at key features in the environment so again now we're moving on to sort of geography and artwork if you're exploring color what's really interesting is lying on your back and you might want to see are any clouds the color of blue or it could be do we have greens that match one of the greens here so these are viewing frames again they're made from swatches of, of paint palettes what was really interesting was when i took this to australia it didn't work for my grounds because most of the places i was working in australia happened to have red soil so again place specific but always worth a conversation so you can see that you take an idea which is a square which is a frame and you see how it's been transformed again and again and again and children's ideas some children want to write on it here's a chalkboard that's covered like that because sometimes who says a chalkboard doesn't have to have a hole in it like that 
portable chalkboards, dead easy. Other things that work well, um, just while you're here, I, d I did say the one luxury item I think that is really worth getting is A3 clipboards because for do you see the size of them and it's great because you can rest your elbows on there that's better for coordination and pencil control so those are really really useful for all ages um, and i often start with tiny little um, sheets of paper sort of a5 a6 for working outside because paper just gets ruined in the, the the rain whereas little bits of paper seem to be less affected by wind and rain as does cardboard and again just use scrap stuff so i just thought that would be quite useful to know as, as a quick um, sort of top tip. Let's see if I can go back to the sharing. Oh, brilliant. So I'm going to finish this with just another way of capturing learning. And as usual, it's an idea that um, came from another school. Do you see how many of these ideas aren't mine? You know, I just build on them because I'm a teacher and I collect like a magpie and I remember or I sow these seeds. You know, so I had a year in an outdoor centre in Canada, in Aus in Ontario, and that was in 1995-96. I collected seeds of ideas there and I still haven't sown many of them. So again, be a seed collector and planter of ideas. And this is just a little video made by um, Middleton Park, um, the older children, of a collaborative lesson that they planned and prepared and worked with a younger class, a kindergarten class, to do. It's just two minutes, but then they also created this video to go with it. And when you go to their Vimeo website and you will see on my blog, if you Google, if you put in Middleton Park into the search, you will see examples of the videos that have been created, some by the teachers, but many by the children themselves. Let's see if this works. <laughs> So that's just an example of, of one of the many little video clips that you can see on their website, their Vimeo website. All right. Two. <laughs> All right. So that's the end of my presentation. And, and I hope that um, if you have time to stay and you want to, to have discussions or questions, that would be fantastic. If, if you don't, I would just like to thank you again so much for coming here. Please do visit my blog and my website. I'm in the middle of updating many posts. Please do feel free to contact me on the uh, address there if there's anything specific, or you'll find me on Facebook and Twitter and the normal sort of channels too. I'm not so good on Instagram, I'm afraid. So. Um, so please do get in touch if, if you don't have time today. And um, I'd also love to hear your brilliant outdoor ideas too. No pressure. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. That was incredible. Um, and you can't see it yet, but I will save the chat. And, you know, you could probably, if you peek at it now, you'll just see all of the positive uh, waterfall of gratitude and joy. And, 
the fact that you did spark so many opportunities for people to share with each other um for you know relevant to their specific grade or things um but look let's crack on with a few questions we um we're slightly over because it was just fantastic and we just had to to let all the all the knowledge roll out so we're just going to do like 10 quick minutes of questions and then we'll do some prizes after that but here we go i'm going to dive right in so rissa stevens asked can i use some of the quotes from this presentation in a grant i'm writing giving you full credit of course yes yeah, sure no problem yeah <laughs> okay wonderful katie and courtney both asked about resources for ages three and under so that early learning yeah so a, a lot of the time when you're working with under threes and again other people will chip in here because i know there's some high experts of 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 people who work with this very younger age group just common sense says do the choke hazard test think about things that can be peeled off and think about your children where they're at developmentally so common sense says if you've got a child who's putting everything in their mouths then taking them to an area where there's trees with poisonous berries is not a good idea or providing that do you know what I mean there's, that's just going to be a stressful situation um, in terms of other things if if you look at a lot of the things like do you remember the mirror on the flap that works very very well with babies and children with a developmental age of under three um, things like the white sheets work well and again sometimes with babies putting even things like holes to explore in sheets or tarps so if you wear out a tarp and there's a hole cut a hole and let babies have a look and a feel and you can move that to different places as well um, a, a lot of it just depends on going with the flow there's some good books out there um, there's one for um, children under three years by a woman called Helen Bilton so that's very useful um if you look at the work by jan white that's very useful and i don't know oh we've got nikki buchan here so nikki buchan runs natural learning she has a lot of experience again of working with babies and un and under threes um also we've got um i don't know if elizabeth henderson is still here but google her and all her auto ethnicity um, because again, she's got some great ideas and, and reams of experience. So again, it's just a case of, of adapting to the age group. I know that's a bit of a garbled response, but I hope it it, it helps. No, I think it's super valuable. Um, Callisto asked, do you have any tips for folks wanting to spend the day outside with their students if there's significant amount of snow on the ground? Uh, and there were a lot of um recommendations in the chat about you know having lending libraries and making sure you have the right gear and visiting charity or thrift shops but anything you'd like to add to that um I've, I've, so much depends on the climatic conditions where you work you can have a snow day that's brilliant outside with dry snow shiny weather do you know what i mean minus five below bright weather you know you need your sunscreen on and you, you know, but sometimes it can be great going out there. Other times it, it doesn't work. It's just too wet or it's just, it's just, it's not right because your children don't have the right kit and things like that. So everything is context driven. And a good thing to do there is to ask other people in your locality and your climatic area what they do. You know, uh, and, and it's a bit, you know, I have to be careful here because I come from mild Scotland, <laughs> you, know, where, you know, where we where it's hard to envisage, you know, where, you know, I have people who are saying six, I work with people who at 16 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. We've got people going, hey, it's affy hot here, <laughs> <laughs> which if you're in <laughs> Australia, you're, you're bunging on your, your sort of, you know, your, your warmest jumpers at 16 degrees. So everything is context with rare weather totally and i live where there's 10 meters 30 foot of snow um i'm seeing in here lots of painting of snow using food coloring in different uh, receptacles those squeezy bottles that you can get to to do different art paintings you can do tracks in the snow and do stories about different animals that might live there um but yes uh connecting with your local people okay i'm going to keep moving because there are so many um Callisto also asked, how do you approach the aspect in, 
of things in nature that might feel awkward to touch, um, like getting your hands in the mud. Um, and could you do something like bring the dog poo back if you were wearing gloves? Like, you know, is that just a personal choice of your comfort level? Ooh, I think I think it's not. So, I think there's two things there. There's the the what what just isn't isn't advisable to collect. I mean, if you take something like um, a hypodermic needle, for yeah. example, probably you will have to adhere to your strict school, municipality, provincial guidelines, whatever exists out there about whether it's cordoned off, who picks it up, how it's picked up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So some things you, you know, have tight protocols, other things, you know, it, it's a hard one. If so, I work mainly in an urban area and when we go into local green space there will be dog poo so common sense says you need some place that is free of dog poo to work and we tend to do a little sort of you know we become dog poo detectives and there was a, <laughs> there used to be a lovely video yeah, I honestly, yes. it removed. and you get the children to line up and they take a step forward and check what's at their feet a step forward oh, and you clear a safe space which is where you then put down tarps and um, your um, knapsacks that each child is wearing to create that safe space. And then you have an agreed system for flagging up dog poo. So you might clear dog poo from one area, but there's only so much dog poo you can collect, isn't there, before it just gets too much. And also alongside that go, uh, go goes other learning. So is the, there's the talk about that, there's the talk about the hand hygiene, um, how the dog poo is collected, where it actually goes, and then can we bring a dog warden in to talk to the children? I don't know if you have dog wardens over in Canada or other parts of the world, but these are people who come in to talk to both the public, but they'll do school and nursery talks as well, so that the children get a, a much, it, it becomes a learning experience in its own right. I don't know if that answers the question, but maybe I think so. Help. Yeah, I think so. And it's a judgment call, isn't it? But if you've got a clean space that's perhaps not open to the public and you want to get dirty, I think dirty hands is a sign of a great of a great lesson and soap and water will do the trick. Yeah. Oh, OK, I think that's a good point, Jade. Not every child likes getting their hands dirty. Everyone seems to have different thresholds of dirtiness. Um, and, and I think I think we need to respect Children, where children are coming from and you will see this and you will actually see many videos of children too when they're in mud and they're keeping their hands up mm. you know um I, I also think it's quite important to that way that if you if you do have quite grubby activities do you have opportunities for the children to wash their hands outside do you have a spa tap or a canister of water and can this happen for the children who need it and also you might have to have that anywhere I don't know what your regulations are in all the different parts of the world but as a general rule it's it it's it's quite useful if you're going off site or you're not near toilets to have some hand washing facilities just you know a bottle of water soap that sort of thing too brilliant thank you um shannon asked um good resources for child, young children aged perhaps three to five on mapping outdoor areas uh, and uh, using sticks and circles for counting and i'm going to go your messy maths book <laughs> somebody said about the, these a3 clipboards um i think it'd be a great resource for you to stock um at at um the outdoor learning store but yes um you can make them do you know what i really go for skinted not minted as we say in scotland when you skin yeah you've and got skin money. means you don't have any money as a, as a fellow uk and i can translate for you it means to Thank be you. not have so money <laughs> this is a commercial one make them out of box board do you know what I mean? And, and double them up, do you know what I mean? So that they're strong or get good strong. Yes, they'll disintegrate more quickly, but it's a great starting point for getting going. Um, it really does. Or sometimes I've had schools where a kind um, janitor has made 
a stash out of ply board and things like that so again there's many ways of getting your hands on these sorts of boards but the other place you often find them is um, in office supplies so I first came upon them not in education resource catalogues but in office supply catalogues so your school administrator might have their favorite it might be in their favorite catalogue and they're not too, too pricey <laughs> okay here's what we're going to do because uh, I'm aware of time what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a soft close um so I'm going to just um do the sort of finalizing things we we'll do a really quick prize giving because I think it's really important to um you know prizes are fun uh, and then um if if people are able and Juliet's able to stick around for like another 10 minutes we could we could answer the rest of the questions in there there's just a few more um, but I just wanted to let you know, thank you so much. This has been a phenomenal start um, to the Winter Workshop series. We do have more coming up. We've got them on climate change and sustainability education resources, uh, taking math outdoors specifically, Green Ummer and the Great Outdoors, which is about um, inclusivity and support for the environment, uh, a people's curriculum for the earth, school gardening as well. So please sign up at outdoorlearningstore.com slash workshops and join us for the rest of them um okay really quick prize giving um there is a typing uh element to this and steph is going to be uh looking at the chat for the it's the first person to get the right answer the first two are multiple choice and these two questions are to get a 25 dollar gift card to the outdoor learning store that you could use perhaps to uh, access one of juliet's amazing resources um if you're ready so typing hands at the ready i'm gonna please don't write the answer until i've given you all four a b c d all four options but here it goes how many different tens of thousands of different soils are there in the u.s how many different tens of thousands of different soils are there in the u.s a forty thousand b fifty thousand c sixty thousand or d seventy thousand types of soil Oh my goodness, we still have an enormous number of people here. <laughs> Woo, scrolling back up. Did you find the correct answer? Yeah, so the first person it looks like who wrote D, 7D, uh, was Candy Kaiser or Kaiser, can Candy. Uh, if you want to message me your email and whether a gift card would be better in US or Canadian dollars I will uh you can private message me I'll also put my email in the chat but I know that there's hundreds of messages coming through so it's easy to get lost so uh yeah that's our first winner amazing nice job okay the theme is dirty teaching Juliet so all of the questions have dirt or soil in the title but this one's a bit left field so for any of you more into your pop culture here it comes again multiple choice um please don't type until you've heard all four answers question two in what year did Christina Aguilera release her song dirty featuring the artist Redman a 1990 B, 2002, C, 2010, or D, 2015? Christina Aguilera and the song Dirty, which year? 1990, 2002, 2010, or 2015? I can't even see the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like <laughs> Janet Lawson was the first one to write that in B, 2002. Correct. Nice job. Here we go. Uh, congratulations again. Send Steph your deets in the um, in the chat box there in a private message if you require. OK, question three. This one is not um, multiple choice. It's just first best in best first in best dressed, as we say, or first one to get it. Question three. The movie Dirty Dancing uh, initially had a different name that was based on the autobiographical story of the writer Eleanor Bergstein's childhood. Does anyone know what the name of Dirty Dancing was originally going to be? It was supposed to star Michael Duz Douglas. Oh, I see it. <laughs> but I'm not sure if it was first. Can you see it, Steph? I know it's really tricky to <laughs> scroll back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that it well I see it's my turn and it looks like the first person to write that was uh Elate. I'm not sure if I said your name right there you wrote it at 527 just right on the dot I will I'll private message you too 
Wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah, eyelid, eyelid. I don't know if there's secret D's and G's in there. Um, I bet it's pronounced completely differently, but I so appreciate it. Um, okay, question four, final, final answer. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to say these C and D, these two questions, you're going to win a $25 gift card to the Take Me Outside store. They have beautiful, ethically produced uh, clothing and apparel with really cool um, messages on it. Okay, question four. Here we go. What is the common name coined for the intestinal um, bowel illness, sorry, caused by the microscopic parasite called Gyardia lamblia, which humans get from drinking dirty, contaminated water? So what's the common or nickname for <laughs> the illness? I got, I got our dictionary out today. Uh, I think I see... The first person, are we lo we're looking for beaver fever. That's correct, beaver fever. <laughs> and hopefully you aren't, you don't know this by experience, but uh, mm -hmm. Nadia Taransky was the first one to write beaver fever in there. Okay, congratulations. Thank you so much. So again, um, check your spam for an email. There'll be the recording to this. There'll be instructions to get your certificate of attendance and links to the resources mentioned in the workshop. And if you want to access the resource links from other participants, um, please save the chat before you exit the workshops. You can go to the three dots at the bottom of your chat box and then at, right at the top, it says save chat. I will try and get a copy to you as well, just to be sure. Um, but if you are leaving, let's just a round of applause, even if it's just silently for Mr. Juliet Robertson and the phenomenal, phenomenal input that you've given us uh, and such a fun way to spend the evening, nighttime tomorrow morning if you're in Australia um it's really been fantastic so thank you so much as it's I'm going to dive back in Juliet to questions and I guess people just stay and if people got go they got go um okay Julie asked are any of your resources translated into French because of course we do have French um I have my understanding is that there will be a Canadian French version of dirty teaching coming out when I'm not sure, but certainly that has been um, a discussion point is my understanding. Amazing. En route to you. We'll keep you posted. You can be for sure that we'll be stocking it as soon as it's ready. OK, Monica Elizabeth Sosido asks, do you recommend pre-reading or pre-writing in kindergarten? Um, for example, in an, a forest school or outdoor learning setting, uh, Monica worked in a forest school in Mexico and they don't do any literacy. Uh, and she wondered if if that was how it is in all forest schools or whether that was the right kind of thing. What's what's your take on that? I think I think the first thing is, is how are you defining pre-writing pre-reading and pre-literacy because um, I would suggest that there probably is a lot of literacy happening but maybe it just hasn't been um, emphasized as that what it is on my website there is a blog post called outdoor literacy in the secret garden nursery and it's an example of a play-based approach um, where you don't find alphabets stuck on trees, but the amount of literacy experiences that are happening through the approach absolutely oozed out of the day that I saw there. So, for example, talking and listening are essential, you know, recapping stories. So if you have a gathering at the end of the day and you talk about what you did that day, that's a really important part of um, uh, pre-literacy. Another example is small world play. So if you think of little children creating little worlds, that is scene setting. That's the start of scene setting for story writing. If you think about children going into character, being Superman, that is the start of under, of empathy and understanding what characters are. So I think we need to be really mindful of what we understand pre-reading and pre-writing to be. I, I don't think it's appropriate to teach children handwriting before they are developmentally ready to do so. And I think for that, you go to um, occupation, um, speech and language therapists they will show you photos of what hands look like or if you want to google um ruth swales on twitter 
Swales is written S-W-A-I-L-E-S. She actually has x-rays of hands that show developmentally a hand that isn't ready to, to do the tripod grip and a hand that is. So again, just be mindful of that. And is it possible, I think, you know, when they're picking up sticks, when they're grabbing items, they're building those fine motor skills that are the precursor for holding more fine a tools? Absolutely. If, if you want an excellent activity, now this is going to shock some people, but, but in terms of for your physical development, if you look at what's involved in rock climbing, absolutely amazing you've got pincer grip tripod grip palm grips you've got cross lateral work with your hands and your feet all sorts going on let them climb rocks you know yes. if it's rocks to play play on where there's safe landings and things like that you will find um and petra jaeger I, I i can't take credit for this myself but i'll just um excuse me while i ex here i've got some stones okay and each one is different so each time i go in to pick one i might be using a pincer grip or i might be using several fingers and things like that i might be gripping like that and because each stone is different my hands are being worked and exercised so that's why natural materials and gathered materials work so well because lego is all the same size so you're getting repetition or or very standardized variation whereas with natural materials you're constantly having to work your body that little bit harder it's the same with uneven surfaces it's the same with climbing a tree compared to climbing up steps, that sort of thing. Amazing. Um, someone's just added on to that. Can we talk briefly about risky play and should we be nervous about this kind of play? Um, and I mean, we could do a, there is, and at some point we will do another whole workshop on this because it is a huge thing, but risky play is so important for skill building, right? Well, it is. And I think it's really important to think so so in dirty both books if you notice if you've read them i don't focus very much on risk and there's two reasons for this first of all why why should we be more worried outside about risk than inside if you think for example of sticks and we say we're worried about sticks but then we're handing out pencils that have been sharpened lethally to, to a dangerous point and we're going okay let's let's get the balance here um so so that's one reason i don't want the outdoors to be given this thing of danger danger we're going outside i think we have to be very mindful that we live in a world where risk is part of what we do you know a, a piece of paper is is great for writing on but it can also give us a paper cut that sort of thing so you know we do, we, we we have to be mindful um i don't know if nikki buchan is still here um maybe if if she is she could sort of put her name in the chat so that people can see nikki buchan runs natural learning um and and she is very interested in risky play and further so so she's worth looking at in her work and furthermore you've you've must look at the work of l beta sanderson from Norway. So she was the researcher who looked at the six types of um, risky play, like rough and tumble, using uh, um, dangerous elements and things like that. So that, that that's really useful as, as starting points. If, if I do stuff around risk, a lot of it is around perceptions. So this is really interesting. I have loads of photos and I'm looking because they're probably up there in one part of different risky situations. And I ask people in groups to organize what they see as risk, most risky and least risky and to put the photos into a graded scale. And it's always interesting because different groups um, have different ideas and within groups you have to come to, to a consensus and um, generally that depends on our background and our experience so I used to have one of a child climbing up a rock face like this and very often early years educators would rate this as a risky thing particularly as it was obviously rainy but one day they had an outdoor educator a, a rock climber in their midst who looked at that and laughed and said that 
risky you're joking look at this look at this look at the angle look at this look at the way the kid is not risky at all perfectly safe so again a lot of it is based is based upon our previous experiences absolutely and, yeah work with work with your team to build and, on each other's strengths there and I know that in North America, there is more of a suing culture, for example, than there is in Europe um, in terms of that. But again, I posted a couple of resources in the chat there from North America about the importance of risky play and how you can, you know, share that with your administrators of the benefits overall and things. And then, yeah, of course, there are things you can do like our partners, like the Outdoor Council of Canada and other organizations. You can train in risk management, in boundary setting and things. Um, so that can be a really um, good way to to build your skills um, to let that happen. OK, I'm going to do two more questions because, again, yeah, it is nearly past one o'clock in the morning. It's nearly two o'clock in the morning for Juliet and she's just been phenomenal but i'm going to do um a couple more god there's so many i was trying to pick one um okay can you just ask i've been trying to find more ways to bring outdoors indoors to an extent or be near windows because uh sometimes they don't they don't want to do screen time or indoor insulation but Sometimes they don't go outside because of mud, rain or snow. My thing would be like, go outside anyway. But I'm biased. What do, what do you think if you have to be inside? Maybe it's extreme weather. What do you think, Julia? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Can I be honest and say that's very difficult for me to answer because I live in a country that just does not have extreme weather or very, very rarely. So, um when I, I mean, because I've been ill with, with leukemia, I haven't been teaching for the last two years. And then there was COVID before that. Um, of all the times leading up to 2020, the end of 2020, I can only remember one day where I had to be inside. <laughs> so so I, I struggle <laughs> to answer that. But then... Well but then part of that is 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 therefore i suppose how do i build on the outdoor experiences so inside i i did mention in the thing grabbing things and coming back inside and i've had to do that actually ironically on a couple of courses where it really has been blowing a hooli and really crazy weather um and generally we've just taken ideas like we've taken materials like natural materials and we've done stuff inside and sometimes we've just adapted stuff i mean i actually do actually rather like lego for its versatility even if it's not quite as versatile as as um as natural materials and certainly you can google and you can see loads of examples of naturalized indoor spaces that provide lots of opportunities for bringing the outdoors in and for making the most of 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 that of of the indoor space um, so my apologies for not answering that particularly well. No, that was lovely. And I think um, that's it. Yeah. Bringing them inside. Laura um, Smedshred has written setting up plants near a sunny window. I would say growing seeds in pots on windows, yes. looking at changes in state of matter with water cups inside and outside where you could see them. Transparent versus opaque objects. That's Laura and beautiful. I've done build a world, building jars where you go out really quick and get soil and, and plants and then you build them inside and um but totally understand that sometimes it's not possible to go outside and yeah perhaps you could prep and have an on-store sort of yeah. bucket of of natural things you could pick at when the time came or staring out of the window and 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 um making thoughts about oh like what do I think it would feel like out there on my skin as composed to what it as opposed to what it feels like inside or Chapter 10, section 10.11 onwards is all about linking the indoor and outdoor learning. It includes naturalising your indoor space, um, sharing your outdoor experiences, pressing stuff, journalis, journaling, discovery tables. Um, discovery tables, every, every class needs a discovery table. It's so exciting. 
Um, so all of these sorts of things get artwork to do with outdoor materials. So I did actually write a bit about it, even if my mind went blank, because I don't do that much indoors. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. OK, last question. Um, thank you so much for everyone. I think I got all of them. Maybe I missed a couple. I'm sorry. But um Nishad Mala has asked, do you have any recommendation on, on resources to integrate play within the school curriculum? They have a very tight and strict curriculum that has less flexibility. Yes. So there's there's a lot of work happening in Scotland at the moment. Um, and it, it's, it's a shame I don't have the, the resource immediately to hand. But looking at the continuum between free play and then adult initiated activities and things like that so you can you can think about things like that my advice is so sometimes with with children when i was working in in one school the the children to get them to think about what they were doing with resources i would take photos of the children playing and tiny little video clips then before the next session outside i would just spend a few minutes showing the children what they were doing from the previous session because i was only there on a weekly basis so it wasn't continuous and we would talk about what resources they used the ideas they had we would look at the resources i offered and then we would add to them. And if there were certain things that needed doing, like they, you could see that they were struggling, like they were wanting to build dens, we might have a quick knot tying session or a quicker sharing advice over how to build a really good den so that the children shared ideas, but then went out to play. So that can be one way of doing it so that you're still documenting the learning. Um, there is a woman called Anna F. Grave who has done some lovely work called Planning in the Moment. And I'm looking up here, if I can see it. Now, she goes into sort of grade two, Planning in the Moment, Anna F. Grave. She's got ones like that. She's got four or five books, Anna F. Grave. And um, these are quite good too for moving and discussing what play looks like and how we can slowly build up to formal experiences and how formal experiences can be drawn from pardon me play-based approaches i hope that helps there's many other books out there too that will also assist amazing i'm going to call it it's the middle of the night for you it might be tomorrow for some people and thank you so much to the 200 odd people who stayed around to um have this fantastic discussion Julia, it's been an absolute pleasure. It is absolutely fantastic to, to share in your wisdom. And the chat has just been full of so much gratitude and joy. Um, thank you so much. And to everyone who joined us, thank you again. And um, I wish you all the best. Good night. Thanks so much. Take care. And thank you so much for joining. And my apologies that I can't answer all the questions, but chase me send me an email or, or whatever or get in touch via Facebook.